Thank you. You may be seated. Now, uh, turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 19 as we jump right into our message today. In Luke chapter 19, we'll be talking about the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been preaching in John all the way up to this point, but in order to get a full picture of the, uh, uh, the idea or the, the context of the triumphal entry, we find that it's in all four Gospels. It's not uh, usual that you would see it in all four, but it is. So I'm using Luke chapter 19 as my base today, and we're beginning at verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached uh, Bethpage and Bethany at uh, the hill called Mount of, uh, the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell them, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as they had told them. <clears throat> as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying her colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, put, uh, put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, to the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, The teacher, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as we look at this passage of scripture, we want to notice that it is in all four of the Gospels. Jesus uh, was on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover, and uh, many, many hundreds, uh, thousands, and uh, who knows how many more uh, were going to Jerusalem to spend the Passover in Jerusalem. And even to this very day at Passover time, our Jewish friends will say next year in Jerusalem at the end of the Passover service. But there we see also in the four Gospels, as we put it all together, we see the cleansing of the temple. We see the blind and the lame are cured. We see the protests of the priests. And we see Jesus going to Bethany uh, for the night. So we're, we're leading up to uh, the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now note uh, in, in this whole passage, and this is going to kind of control our understanding of the whole passage, is that Jesus did not refuse the messianic uh, acknowledgement that he was given. You know, who else uh, could uh, these words refer to, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That could not refer to an earthly king. It could only refer to the Messiah. And even the Pharisees caught on. And they said, don't let your disciples say this. You know, why are you allowing them to, to, to think and even suggest, and now they're shouting at the top of their lungs, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, referring to the Messianic king. They said, Lord, uh, Jesus, stop. Tell him to stop. And what did Jesus do? Nothing. He allowed them to offer praise and honor and glory to the king. And that's uh, what we should do today. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So they believed it. They understood that. And the mass crowds, uh, some believed and some didn't. I believed every single person in that crowd. 
at the triumphal entry was hopeful. They were uh, desirous of seeing the, the Lord come to free them from the bondage of, uh, of Rome. And uh, they would hope that their Messiah would come and, uh, and relieve them from the stresses and the persecution and the, <clears throat> and the control of the Roman government. But this was not a physical uh, a deliverance of the, of the kingdom of, of Israel at that time. It was a deliverance of all people from their sins. Because remember the reason Jesus came, he came to save his people from their sins and he was on his way to the cross to make that happen. So <clears throat> we want to notice first of all uh, in our passage the uh, submission of Jesus to the will of the Father, beginning there in verse 28 in Luke uh, 19. So this is the first thing that we want to see, the submission of Jesus to the will of the Father. In Luke chapter 19, 20, 28, he says, after the disciples telling the story, Jesus went to Jerusalem walking ahead of his disciples. Very, uh, all four of the Gospels give us a picture, a full picture of what happened on this occasion. And it's uh, really quite remarkable as you think about other passages of Scripture of what we call narrative passages. We find four Gospels, each one uh, saying the same thing and uh, each one adding a little bit more uh, details to what the what was happening at this occurrence so they were ahead of his disciples and in John 10 verses 22 to 40 we find there was danger ahead and there was an attempt on the life of the Lord Jesus Christ at that at that time and all of these things are coming down to the actual triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ there was fulfillment of prophecy, and jot this down or circle it in your study Bibles or whatever, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. We are going to talk more about that, but this point, for this first point, we're talking about the fact that Jesus was submitting himself to the will of the Father. And as he came into Jerusalem, the donkey was uh, prepared, and can you, can you imagine uh, the, uh, the consternation of the individuals who owned that donkey? First of all, saying, you know, why would you do this? It's a valuable commodity. It would be like somebody coming to your house and said, look, I'd like to borrow your car for the afternoon. Would that be okay? And uh, they were probably not real happy about it, but uh, as they thought about who Jesus was, they were hopeful too that maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is really the king who has come in the name of the Lord. Um, so <clears throat> there was submission to the will of the Father's will. Submission to the Father's will. So the Lord Jesus Christ in his, uh, uh, in the John passage talks about the fact no one takes my life I lay it down on my own accord, and I take it up again. He had the authority from God the Father to do this. And <clears throat> we see what is happening is that all of this is culminating in coming up to the cross. Ahead is the Last Supper, which is also the First Communion. There is the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, the scourging, and then ultimately the cross. So we see all of these things. Uh, Jesus is following the will of his Father. He said, Lord, in another passage, if, if you could take this cup away from me, this cup of the beatings and torture and scourging, and Lord, just take it away. And uh, what was Jesus' final answer to that? It says, not my will be done, but your will be done. So he was following perfectly 
uh, the will of the Father in all of this, and in the scourging, and, in, and ultimately the cross. It was not meaningless. It was not an accident. It was not a, uh, a surprise uh, to Jesus that this was going to happen. Remember, he sweat drops of, of uh, blood and, and uh, water out of his body as he thought of the, uh, the torture that was going to be ahead of him. Uh, but then, in speaking of, the, of this, the, the torture and the scourging of our Lord Jesus, I always want to mention that that is only the external side of the, the, uh, the crucifixion. The internal side is that Jesus experienced everything that you and I experienced in this life and that there, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us, but one who has been tempted and tested in all things, just as we are, yet he was without sin. <clears throat> so the Bible, <coughs> the Bible tells us of the submission of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. And the second thing that we see in this passage is the submission of the disciples to the will of the Savior. The submission of the disciples to the will of the Savior. Now here we go back to the passage and think about uh, what, it, what was happening at that time. And Jesus said, go to the village, uh, find a colt. Uh, when the owners ask you what you're going to do with it, you're saying the master needs it. The Lord needs it. So the first thing we see in terms of the submission of the disciples to the will of the Savior is they actually did what he told them to do. Now let me ask you a question. This might be a hard one. Are you doing what the Lord is telling you what you should do regardless of whether you agree with it or you are not sure of the significance of what the Lord is asking you to do. Things like love your neighbor as yourself. Things like uh, uh, giving your enemy a glass of water for crying out loud, why in the world would you feed him or give him a glass? Why would you do that? But the Lord asks you to do that and he, he wants us to be submissive to him. He asks us to forgive one another and the scripture says, just as Christ has forgiven you, so you also should forgive one another. Are you submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ in that area of your life? Or are you, are you working uh, you know, hard to exact revenge in your pound of flesh out of somebody else? And you're not speaking to somebody uh, because of something they did to you about 40 years ago. And uh, the Bible tells us that we need to forgive just as Christ has forgiven us. Are you submitting to the will of the Savior? <clears throat> In Luke chapter 19, uh, just as a review, they were willing <clears throat> to submit to the Savior. They were willing to submit <clears throat> to the Savior. Cough. In the John passage, not only were they putting their cloaks on the ground and so forth in front of the Lord, the crowds took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. And notice the word, they shouted. I just wanted to kind of underline uh, that score, that there was a lot of enthusiasm here. A number of years ago, I may have told you this before, uh, friends of ours took us to the opening football game of the New York Jets and the New York Giants. Now, <clears throat> now, in, in normally you go to a football game and uh, the crowds are yelling and screaming for one team or the other. So if the other ten team uh, scores something, you don't hear too many shouts. You might hear some boos or, uh, you know, whatever from the crowd. But the Giants and Jets were playing, and everybody was a fan of one of the teams. So for, for uh, the entire course of that, of that game, the noise from the crowd shouting 
was deafening. It was just absolutely, it made you have a headache. It was so loud. I don't know if Mary Jane remembers that, but that was really loud. And I can imagine that this is what is happening now as Jesus is about ready to, to go into uh, Jerusalem. He's going a uh, pathway uh, uh, to Jerusalem and uh, they're going in the eastern gate. They're thinking, oh my goodness, this is the Messiah. The Savior has come and he's coming on a colt. Now we'll talk about that in just a minute, minute the significance of that. But here they were shouting, and this, I think, is a key uh, to understanding this passage. Hosanna, let's say it together. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Now, I want you to imagine yourself on the side of the road with the palm branches on the ground with people throwing their coats on the ground. And I want you to, to, to say it like they uh, shouted to the Lord. Let's say it together. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Can you imagine that? That just made, just you doing that made my thing made get all tingly up here. Hosanna, the word itself, in the Hebrew language means to save now, or in um, modern parlance would be, salvation has come. Salvation has come. And I'm sure there were some in the crowd uh, who believed that with all of their heart and mind and soul, not just because of the political ramifications, not just because uh, they wanted to be rid of uh, the, uh, the terrible uh, yoke of Israel, or of, uh, of Rome, but there were many there in that crowd who did not fully understand or comprehend, and that actually is borne out later on when we see people in the crowd calling for his crucifixion uh, later on. But we see the Lord Jesus here on the, uh, uh, coming into uh, Israel into Jerusalem and the crowd is shouting these words salvation has come Hosanna Hosanna and the last thing that we want to see in this passage is the submission of the donkey to the creator I told you we'd be talking more about this the submission of the donkey to the savior now why is that important you say well he's just an animal he's just a poor creature uh, you know, e even, uh, you know, in, in the Luke passage, he says, bring it uh, to me. Uh, you know, you say, well, what possible importance could this possibly have for you and for me? The, the, the idea that uh, the donkey is coming and Jesus is sitting on that donkey. And notice... Right after they were shouting these words, there were Pharisees in a crowd, and they were saying, teachers, this is verse 39 of Luke 19, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And did Jesus obey the Pharisees? No, he obeyed his heavenly Father. And he accepted the praise and worship that was due to his name because uh, he is the king of glory. Now, there's several things, uh, that, uh, three things actually that I want you to see in the passage. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is uh, the riding on a donkey would be a startling fulfillment of Zechariah chapter nine and verse nine and that passage says rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout daughter of Jerusalem see your king comes to you riding righteous and having salvation gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey very specific prophetic truth that Zechariah is suggesting. 
uh, uh, and uh, you would ask, if somebody asked you, you know, what did the pastor preach about? Well, he preached about a donkey. And, uh, and I would suggest to you that that's not a bad thing because Zachariah did as well, and I'm in good company. And there was a, it was a very specific uh, prophecy that uh, Zechariah is sharing here about this donkey. <clears throat> in ancient uh, Israel, the judges and prophets used the donkey as a sign of their divine commission. And the average Jewish person would see this as Jesus proclaiming his authority and kingship. So the significance of the donkey was not just a vehicle or a, a way to tra be transported into Jerusalem. Jesus specifically asked for a foal, a young colt, and, uh, <clears throat> and the prophetic teaching of Zechariah makes it very clear that it is, is to be a specific colt a specific kind of colt, a young one. And uh, uh, the uh, owners of that uh, donkey gave him up to the disciples, not knowing that they would ever get that d uh, donkey back or not. My personal uh, idea, maybe behind it, not scripture, is that they probably followed along because they're saying, what are they gonna do with this donkey? And as Jesus mounted that donkey, the Bible tells us in the, in the Luke passage that the disciples put Jesus on the donkey. Interesting uh, thing about that donkey. They put him on the donkey. They had to lift him up, and they put him on top of that donkey. <clears throat> and um, I'm not uh, clear or sure that they fully understood the, the total significance or whether somebody was quoting Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 at that point. But the symbolism is absolutely clear. The fulfillment of prophetic truth is, is, is there. It is completely fulfilled by this donkey. We see another donkey in Numbers chapter 22. I want to preach on that sometimes. That's one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament where the donkey speaks to Balaam. A really cool passage, but... In this passage here, this donkey takes on great significance, far greater than we could possibly imagine today. For uh, the king or the prophet to, or the judge to come into a town riding on a donkey, that means that prophet, that judge meant business. <clears throat> that prophet... Uh, that judge who was riding on the donkey was worthy of the respect <clears throat> of everybody who saw him, saw him coming into the city limits. Oh, my, look at this. That uh, prophet is coming to us riding on a donkey. We are in for it. We are, are going to hear something that maybe we don't want to hear. And uh, the authority of the prophet riding on the donkey was a very clear uh, thing in the Old Testament times of the prophets and judges. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I, I need to repeat uh, Zechariah 9, 9 again. Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even a donkey's colt. And thirdly, in this passage, is the submission of the donkey submitted to Jesus. The submission, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the stubborn will of the donkey uh, submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you have ever tried to work with or uh, been near donkeys? They are not, uh, used, as a general rule, willing to do what you want them to do. It's sort of like cats. Cats don't do that. I don't know, maybe you have a cat that does. I saw a lady once who did have a cat that obeyed their commands. But as a general rule, 
They don't obey your commands. They don't do what you want them to do, do they? <clears throat> they are, they are there. They're their own donkey, and uh, they are not going to take any guff from anybody. If somebody wants them at a particular moment in time while they're feeding on the really sweet grass in the meadow and you want them to go pull something, they are not in a mood to be obedient to you at that moment in time. And yet this donkey was submissive to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> The stubborn will of the donkey submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we see the crowds screaming and yelling and rejoicing and calling out, Hosanna, the Lord saves us. And we are looking forward to that today. Well, you may ask yourself, how is it that you can be saved? The Bible tells us that, that we are sinners and in need of a savior. The Bible tells us that it is Christ alone who is able to save us from our sins. And the Bible tells us that as many as received him, that is Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Now this morning, I want to ask you the question, are you submitting to the will of the Savior this morning. Have you listened to his voice? Those of you who have submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the most difficult things on this, on this earth is to uh, listen to somebody else telling us uh, what to do. And that is something that causes great anxiety and angst among a lot of people that other people would tell you what to do. But the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us specific and clear commands. And it is your choice to decide whether you want to obey him and follow him or not and be submissive to him. And I would, I would uh, ask all of us today, have we submitted our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ? Like the disciples did in the in this uh, story and parable, I mean this uh, story in Scripture. Have you submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ today? Is He your Savior and is He Lord? And if you come to the point in your walk with God that you can say with confidence, Hosanna, salvation has come. I know that he is my Lord and I will be with him for all eternity. And maybe if you're not sure this morning, you can make it sure today. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And John writes, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And for those who have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, what a better day than today. If God is calling you and moving in your heart, that this morning you respond to him in submission to his will and say, Lord, save me, make me your child. And then you too can say, Hosanna, salvation has come. And for Christians, those who have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, have you come to that point in your life where you have submitted yourself totally and completely to him? And sometimes throughout the course of our lifetimes, we have to do that multiple times as we uh, grow uh, weary uh, in our hearts and souls. And we need to submit ourselves to him once again and say, Lord, I submit myself to you, Lord Jesus. And I uh, ask you, Lord, to help me and help me to see that salvation has come. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We do pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us this morning. I do pray that you will help us to submit to the Heavenly Father. Help us to submit to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who have not as yet made that commitment, they would do so even today. And for those who have made that commitment, may we recommit our lives and resubmit ourselves to you this morning. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, uh, we anticipate uh, you being joining with us next uh, 
uh, Friday for our Good Friday service. And uh, we welcome uh, you there for that service and our Easter Sunday morning service next week at 11. Thank you all for coming.